So, Lawrence Prowse, very welcome to Fritanki Podcast. It's wonderful to be with you and virtually and, and to see you again. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a few years, but uh, you, you were in Stockholm twice, I think. I had you here twice, right? Yes, twice, and both times were remarkable. So I really and last last time I think was with uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and Jana Levin, right? Ooh, was that true? I don't remember that one. I remember <laughs> one, I remember we had a wonderful event with a bunch of philosophers at um. In a That's the first one. Here. That's the first one. First time. Maybe it was with Richard and Jan. I, I frankly have forgot, but probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you were actually. Anyway, um, uh, we've just published your your uh, latest book, uh, "The Known Unknowns." This is what it looks like in Swedish. <laughs> oh, oh, great! It's the first time I've seen it. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'll I'll make sure you you get it when you come here in September. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, it, it's it's pretty nice actually. And um, first, I'd like to ask you. Uh, I mean. What what made you decide to write a book about what we don't know in the universe? I mean, normally you write books about what you know. <laughs> well, I think um, you know, I think it's the beginning of of uh, of exploration for everyone is to think about what needs to be known, and it was a wonderful way for me to kind of, in order to talk about what we what we don't know, I have to bring you up to the edge of knowledge. I have to bring you up to where what what we mm. know, and it was a wonderful way to encapsulate. Um, the forefront ideas in what I thought were the you know, five general areas of, of human intellectual inquiry, time, space, matter, life, and consciousness, the most interesting open questions in science. And I think it's exciting. I mean, people, when you discuss science as something that we've sort of already discovered, it's nice, but but what really excites people is 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 the thought of learning something new, of, of discovering something. And, and recognizing you don't know something is the first step on the voyage of discovery. And uh, the it's also, as I say in the very beginning of the book, something we all have to recognize and acknowledge that we should be more we should be more proud of not knowing instead of embarrassed about not knowing. It's the yeah. thing that parents and teachers should be willing to tell kids because then it's a voyage of discovery together. Also, frankly, I think this may be my last science book, and really? I. And I thought I would, you know, it, it follow. It's an, I think, a natural culmination of the things I've written, where I've talked about things to finally take us to the edge and 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 and, and a voyage of discovery. And I hope, well, I hope a hundred years from now, or fifty years from now, or whatever, that it's it's viewed as quaint, uh, uh, because I really hope that we'll have discovered a lot more. There was, a, I mentioned a book by a famous British scientist and writer, Sir James Jeans, in 1930, almost a hundred years ago, called The Mysterious Universe which mm. was kind of a similar. And if you read it now, it's, it's very, very quaint. I'd like mm. to say that, I mean, more, of more interest than the known unknowns are the unknown unknowns. Except uh, that's your next book. Well, yeah, it's a very, <laughs> the problem is the unknown unknowns is a very short book. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. But, but it, it, you know, really, that's what's, what's really, I think, the most remarkable thing about science is you, you try and understand what, what, the th what the major outstanding puzzles are. But in your process of working to discover them, what nature inevitably tells us is, is it leads us often in new directions that were entirely unexpected. And so, mm. so that's, uh, that's the voyage of discovery I wanted to describe. Okay, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, I'd like to go right into the, the most fundamental questions here, actually. And <clears throat> you, you have these chapters, time, space, matter, life, and consciousness. And and I w actually would, would like to start with matter in the middle. Um, would you say that there is no coherent view of what matter is today? I mean, is it is it this superposition uh, wave function or is it material? I mean, it's okay, matter well, an emergent phenomena from the a wave equi equation or what would you say? Well, I, I, no, I don't think I'd be so so bold as to say that. I think I think our fundamental understanding of the of the building blocks of matter are are well for the most part very well understood i mean we know the particles that make up the universe the way those things behave and now what you're alerting to is quantum mechanics the way matter mm -hmm. behaves at a fundamental scale is subject to quantum mechanics and there once again quantum mechanics is a beautiful theory it's a well-defined mm -hmm. theory it's just a theory that's impossible to understand classically. 
So there are many yeah. different ways of thinking about, you know, this table looks solid and, and it's a, yeah. and classically it is, but we understand quantum mechanically it's quite different. First of all, most of it is empty space. Uh, the, the reason my hand doesn't go through the table is not because it's solid in that sense, but because the forces of the, from the electric forces of the atoms in my hand that get repelled by the atoms in the, in, 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 in the desk. But, yeah. but at a fundamental scale, the way things behave is quite different than what we see. The world we see is really an illusion in that sense. But, you know, so there are many different ways of thinking about a classical version of quantum mechanics. And my whole point in that, in that, in that chapter, to some extent, was to point out that I really think that's a misplaced way of thinking. It's like mm-hmm. trying to discuss a, a curved universe in terms of a flat universe. You always result in things that sound crazy. Well, you, you shouldn't do that. Quantum mechanics is the fundamental picture of reality. So to try and present it in terms of this classical picture, which is an approximation, you're always going to result in craziness. And it was a colleague of mine, a late colleague of mine, Sidney Coleman at Harvard, who was a brilliant and amusing colleague, who um, who said, you know, he wrote, a, he gave a great talk called Quantum Mechanics in Your Face. But the main point was that that uh, that to think of, to have a, an, uh, people often talk about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. We should talk about the interpretation of classical mechanics. It's crazy to talk about interpreting the underlying theory in terms of this this superficial picture, which is not right, because we're always going to come up with different explanations, different things that are going to sound crazy. And quantum mechanics does sound crazy because uh-huh. you and I are classical beings. We don't experience quantum mechanics directly. So when we try and interpret it, we come up with the many worlds interpretation or complementarity, yeah. all these fascinating philosophical pictures but the underlying physics says well the world isn't that way it isn't mm. you know so we could talk about you know people say well every time you measure something you 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 pick one branch of an infinite reality and it all sounds beautiful you can write books about it but in fact it's just a in my opinion that's the wrong way of doing it it's it's we should talk about how the quantum mechanical world which is fundamental evolves into the classical world and how the classical world is an imperfect picture of this strange world. And I try to give examples, a strange world. In reality, electrons are really spinning in all directions at once, even though it seems impossible. Mm. And you can't picture it in any nice picture. So we try to say, well, let's imagine a classical way of understanding that, and we can do that. But none of them capture the true picture of quantum mechanics, which is that Mm. the electron is literally in doing many things at once. It's in, as you pointed out, a superposition of many Mm. states. And we could try and understand, you know, we, we, we don't have a good, a good way of picturing it because we never, we never experienced that directly. Indeed, one of, my, uh, uh, one of the things I hope for quantum computers like Richard Feynman, uh, and I talk about a little bit about quantum computers at the end of the book, but one of the reasons Richard Feynman wanted to develop a, a quantum computers is because he thought they might help him understand quantum mechanics because literally <laughs> a quantum computer uses quantum mechanics to think. And so it, it literally... Uh, if you want to, if, if it, it 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 understands quantum mechanics in a way that we never will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, w- would you agree that we have to give up some intuitive notions of reality, like locality, for example? Do we, we have? have to... But it's true in all of science. I mean, quantum mechanics is perhaps the most extreme example. But the wonderful thing about science is we have to give up our myopic picture of reality and realize it's an illusion. And that's okay. It doesn't mean, I don't mean this new age version of illusion. We have a well-defined picture of what's actually happening. But the world we see is is very different from the underlying reality. And, and when you say we have to give up locality, we only have to give up locality if we want to think about the world cl- classically. Classical locality goes out the window. But, uh-huh. but, but locality in a quantum mechanical sense is quite different. So sure, it looks like it, you know, entanglement is the most is the most clear example yeah. where if I have two elementary particles and I, I prepare them in a certain state, one would spin up and one would spin down. And I separate them. They're both they're spinning in all directions, but they're spinning in opposite directions from each other. And then when I measure so one, boom, I, I fix it to be in that state. Then the other one has to be in that state. It sounds like there's an instantaneous non-local interaction. But the problem is that's when you think about it classically, if they're entangled, they're never really separate objects. They're all part of no. the same object. And so, so uh, it's not too... They're described by the same wave function. Yeah, they're described by the same wave function, and that's the fundamental object. And it's kind of like, you know, 
pulling the tail on a cat, I hate to say it that way, causes it to <laughs> meow on the, in, 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 <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a cat. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, okay, uh, but you st you say we have to give up locality only if we think about it in, in, classically. But I mean, still, uh, the notion of locality is a classical concept, right? So yeah, sure, exactly, and that's why you're right. So I, I mean, you're absolutely right. You have to, if you think about the world as 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 a sensible world that we try and picture and do experiments on, and then then we have to give up this classical notion of locality. Absolutely, yeah, and okay. we have to give up. But we have to give up many other classical notions. We have to give up the notion that you that a particle exists somewhere in space, when yeah. when in fact it, it, it there's a probability that it's here, and in fact it, it it's actually in many places at once. So we have to give up in with quantum mechanics, maybe more than relativity. We have to give up almost all of our fundamental notions about what makes sense in the universe, which, by the way, is important because. Uh, you, we often it, the universe doesn't care what makes sense to us. It is the way it is, and we we evolve this a, a sense of common sense. You know, evolutionary psychology tells us why we think certain things are sensible, and so our evolved sense of what seems reasonable is a proper property of our own evolution. And there's no reason for the universe to 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 coincide with what we think makes common sense. And I what I love about science is it teaches us our notions of common sense can be can be wrong. We're myopic. And that's where it opens your mind. That's why I mean yeah. by not knowing in, some, in, in a really important way. I tell students, and I don't think it happens so much in university anymore, but it used to, that, that if one thing I hope for every student to have this experience of some notion that they have that, that, they, that is central to their view of the world, that makes, makes the world make sense for them, to be proved wrong, because it's that liberation to realize that your view yeah. of what's normal, it's what's sensible, may not be true, whether it's in science or anthropology or society more generally, that opens your mind mm. you know, in a vitally important way to be suspicious of what you think is normal or sensible, mm. to always be skeptical of yourself, mm. which is really a central part of science. I really agree with you. And, and uh, the, the times as they are now, the people are much more skeptical to that in, in general. People are very afraid of, of, of yeah. there's, there seem to be sacred, no, it used to be the only sacred notions were in religion. And now we have these sacred notions in the secular world that there's some things you can't talk about. You can't ask questions and you know what they are as well as I do. And I won't even yeah. mention them here, but, but, yeah. but the notion that there are some things that you can't question is that, antithetical to the whole progress of science and scholarship more generally everything should be subject to question yeah. and everything might be proved wrong in fact it it goes more generally to this notion of a free speech which i've been spending a lot of my own time writing about lately yeah. the, the reason and it was you know was hume probably first but i learned it from christopher hitchens the the reason free speech is so important is not to protect the speech of the speaker but protect your right to discover you're wrong mm. because if you if all dissenting ideas are not allowed to be expressed you never can discover that maybe you're wrong and so you yeah. you lose that fundamental right of of changing your mind if you close off uh, uh speech to anything that disagrees yeah. with you and and um and a central part of that is understanding that you may think you know everything but you don't and exactly. we're opening up to the fact that you, we do not know. And that's the point why I love the title, The Known Unknowns, is that yeah. it's a central part. And it's really not just a central part of science. It's a central part, in my opinion, of being a, of being a human being, is opening yourself up to new experiences and realizing that there's so much about the world that you haven't experienced. And it makes yeah. life every day more exciting. No, I completely agree with you. And in a way, you could also say that free speech uh, protects your right to discover that you're right. Because if you think you're right without good arguments, then you don't really know you're right. Exactly. And science, you know, there's a, a writer, American writer that I like a lot, Jonathan Rauch, who's written a book about, about this. And, and he really made the point that science is a social activity and a, it's a, it fundamentally depends on a dialectic, not a Marxist dialectic, but, but <laughs> the, the notion that science requires every idea to suddenly be open to attack by others. Because yeah. only then will you, the ideas that are right be, be, be discovered and, and be, be reinforced. They get stronger when, you, when they're attacked, much like people to some extent. Uh, and and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it protects both rights. 
it, it, you'll never this almost first of all we don't learn anything by revelation i'm let me make that quite clear and yeah. therefore any ideas that are ingrained in the absence of empirical evidence are likely to be wrong and mm. i think that's true for many of the claims that are made from the religious right and the left and the, and the politically correct left nowadays yeah 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 but uh, just going back to the, the the quantum issue again, I mean, some people would argue that this non-locality sort of uh, aspect of reality, it, uh, it's something that was, um, uh, what do you call it in English, something that was presented by Eastern philosophers like 2000 years ago. What do you say to them? <laughs> well, I say, look, whenever people talk about this, you know, when you have vague notions, you could always right. find ancient with quote unquote wisdom that yeah. reproduces those vague notions but the but but to say it's the same thing is just ludicrous uh mm -hmm. you, you can if you say something vaguely what well, okay tell me the wave function calculate how it's going to behave predict the future all of that they weren't able to do at all so i always worry when people say oh yes this was understood three thousand years ago or two thousand years ago by the ancient wisdom well they they had interesting and vague notions but they couldn't do anything with them and uh, and therefore, you know, you might call it wisdom. And there are, you know, I mean, when maybe when it comes to human affairs, there's wisdom, ancient wisdom. But when it comes to the universe, um, ancient wisdom pales in comparison to what we now know. And 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 it almost always involves some vague statement that can be interpreted so many ways. Just like religious, you know, people will say, yeah. you know, look in in the Bible, it says this, and it's just some vague statement that you can interpret a thousand different ways, most of which are wrong, and one of which might be right. I mean, so yeah. it's, 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 I, I have very little, I love ancient, I love ancient history. So don't let me put that down. But I, I think this notion of ancient wisdom, or even to make it more uh, politically charged, indigenous knowledge, which in the West is such a, a big deal, where e even let's say in New Zealand, where, where they were saying that indigenous knowledge should be taught alongside science and science classes, as if they're the same. And they're not. I mean, some indigenous knowledge about medicines might be, but but it's my friend Tim Minchin, who's a, a yeah. Minchin, he, you know, he he said, you know what what they call alternative medicine that works, medicine. Uh -huh. Exactly. <laughs> and and it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. Ind indigenous knowledge that works is science. It's based on. I was, I, I was just thinking that that this ancient philosophy could be good in creating ideas, but it, it requires science to test if they're and, right or wrong. And they did science. They didn't call yeah. it science, but you know, you, you eat a berry and it either makes you better or it kills you. That's science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's so true. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, my my kid Leo is 14 years old now. And I'm, the other wow. day I was- I remember uh, he was little. Yeah, he was very small when you met him. Uh, <clears throat> Now, now he goes to school to, to eighth grade and uh, wants to study science and so on. And we were discussing gravity the other day. Okay. And in his textbooks, it still says that gravity is a force like other forces. And I tried to tell him that it's not really a force. It's a curvature of space time. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, are we are we sort of limited in the metaphors that we use that that sort of stops people from understanding the universe in the right way? Well, we are limited. Language is more limited than mathematics. And mathematics yeah. is language plus a series of connections that makes it much more powerful than any semantic language. Hmm. But I don't think it's as bad as you state because okay. it turns out that there are many equivalent ways of thinking about things. Richard Feynman was very strong on that. So yeah. it's okay to think of gravity as a force. It, but it also okay. can be th the fact that equivalently, all, that's exactly equivalent, in fact, more rigorously equivalent to understanding it as a curvature of space. But to feel like it's difficult for me to get up out of this chair and there's a force pulling me down is <laughs> perfectly true. It's just there are many equivalent descriptions because, because uh, th that's one of the beauties of nature. Is that, And one of the really exciting discoveries about science is that many equivalent ways mathematically equivalent ways uh, result in completely different pictures my favorite one is of course a mirage which in, on the on the rare hot days in sweden if you're looking at a road uh down the road yeah. you might, might look like it's wet well we understand that as due to the fact that there are layers of 
air and the and the and the hottest air is at the bottom and it's less dense and air refracts it bends at each intersection and it comes back to your eye that's one mm -hmm. way of understanding it but as Feynman pointed well Feynman stressed in 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 one of his popular books that it's a beautiful way of thinking is that there's another way of understanding it it's, it goes back 300 years to Fermat's principle of least time it turns out light will take the 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 path that takes the least time to get your eye and and from the sky it can come straight to your eye but it's going through air which is more dense and it's traveling more slowly and instead it can act like it wants to hang around near near the ground for a lot longer and then come up to your eye because it travels faster near the ground <laughs> now they're very different explanations but they result yeah. in exactly the same prediction oh that's really interesting that's really interesting i was just thinking and really correct me if i'm wrong but i'm thinking that if you if you sort of stick to these classical metaphors of gravity as a, as a force, then it keeps you bound to a Newtonian sort of understanding of the universe, and it makes it more difficult to in interpret the theory of relativity, maybe. I don't know. Oh, no, not well, well, I mean, in, not really, because in fact, what general relativity does is give, if you want to think of one way of understanding general relativity in a kind of Newtonian sense, it's called post-Newtonian approximation, Basically, what general relativity says is Newton said gravity is a force that's one over r squared. Okay, mm. depends on this. But it turns yeah. out that general relativity gives small corrections to that. It's not quite mm. one over r squared in, in certain circumstances. Now, that's due to the fact that space is curved. But you can think mm. of it as just saying general relativity tells you that gravity is a force that is not exactly one over r squared in all occasions. It has corrections. So there's okay. always way, mathematical ways of picturing it that mm. make it sound like a force. But, but um, and and you know it's it's and in some ways there are other aspects of it that make it useful to think of it as a force. For example, the mathematical description of gravity is actually involves a mathematics uh, mathematical symmetry called gauge symmetry that is exactly the same symmetry that des describes the mathematical theory behind the force of electromagnetism. And so thinking mm -hmm. of gravity as a force and, and uh, on the scale uh, like electromagnetism actually produces useful mathematical analogies that you understand symmetries in a new way. And so mm -hmm. there are now at the same time, there were people and, and Kaluza and Klein, and one of them was Swedish, I think, uh, Klein maybe, um, mm -hmm. and, and, um, that, that, uh, that said, well, maybe if gravity is a force, but it's also due to a curvature space, Maybe electromagnetism is a force, but it's also due to a curvature of space, but not the curvature of the space we measure, but maybe there's an extra dimension. And, and electromagnetism reflects a curvature in that extra dimension, a fifth dimension. That the, and it turns out to reproduce many of the equations of, of electromagnetism wonderfully. The reason you've never heard, most people have never heard of them and they win the Nobel Prize is it turns out it also predicts some things that are wrong. But it's mm. a nice mathematical way of trying to make an analogy between math between electromagnetism and gravity you might say that's a sterile analogy but in fact it was that analogy that maybe electromagnetism acts like a curvature in extra dimension that's very that 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 helped prompt some of the thinking behind string theory which suggests there may be extra dimensions so even these apparently sterile mathematical analogies uh can sometimes drive you in useful physics directions yeah yeah i see what you mean um Another topic that I talked with my son about is the, the speed of light and the, the constant uh, quality of speed of light. And that is really hard to explain to, to, to a youngster, I mean, why, how a speed can be constant. And I, I, I wanted to ask you, would you say that it could be correct to talk about the speed of light not as a speed like other speeds, but rather a, a character of the fabric of reality in itself? Well, again, I don't think it's either or. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the point is the speed of light reflects key features of space and time. What it really does is it reflects key features of electricity and magnetism and that are related intimately to the nature of space and time. And, yeah. and so the fact that it's constant is related to a fundamental property of space time, but it is a speed. But you know what? When I come yeah. to Stockholm... I want you to bring your son to the audience and I want you to ask me a question. Yeah, and in three minutes, I'm going to give him an argument for that. He'll understand perfectly why the speed of light is constant. And, and I promise. 
I promise to do that. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. That that's 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 really that's really good. Um, uh, what what would you what what would you say about? Okay, let's see how I can explain this. I mean that the 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 fact that science today, physics. Uh, it's so abstract, mathematically abstract, so it actually can create objects long before uh, we have empirical evidence for them, like black holes, for example. Uh, and now white holes is the next thing that Carl Revelli sort of have yeah. conceptualized, but there is no evidence for it at all. Yeah. Is this a problem for the science itself, that, 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 that your mathematical equations sort of creates reality that you can't test? Well, um, no, because because inevitably, I mean, the good science creates abstract notions that lead us in directions, if they're well defined, that hopefully we can test. Yeah, okay. it's okay. That look, let me take the abstract notion of an atom. Mm. An atom was an abstract notion, and and it wasn't. And for the longest time, it seemed like it would be impossible to ever actually measure and or see an atom now we can quote unquote see them with fancy electron microscopes and things yeah. like that but but that didn't but that abstract notion was incredibly important and it is true that something that we can now you know physics has proceeded so 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 well and been so successful that we extrapolate our ideas to realms where it appears like we'll never be able to test them including maybe the extra dimensions itself but mm -hmm. But the good science constantly looks for remnants that will allow us to test it. And until it's testable, it's only me it's metaphysics, it's not science. But, mm. but, but thinking of abstractions, again, is often helpful because it mm. takes us outside of our myopic picture and maybe presents a new way of thinking that may allow us to do a new way of experimenting. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think the difference between ab abstraction and in physics and abstraction and philosophy is precisely that, that it remains kind of impotent unless you can test it. Uh, and, and, and that's the important thing. And, and so people who are doing string theory aren't doing, they're sure they're being driven by, in some sense, the beauty of the equations and some un underlying ideas about why they're doing what they're doing. But ultimately they're trying to say, let's make predictions that we can test. Yeah. They haven't, but I, at it yet. But I, they haven't no, they haven't succeeded, right? No. And that's, and that's just, and that's not, that's something that doesn't please anybody, including the string theorists. And <laughs> my, my friend uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a weaker room, I don't know whether a weaker room, my friend Frank Wilczek, who went in the whole process in physics, yeah, yeah. Say, you say uh, um, a string theory is promising, and it keeps promising and promising and promising. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe yeah. the point is, but that's, you know, that's not to say that it is, that abstraction has produced incredibly interesting ideas, some of which are relevant in other areas of physics. And for all we know, may allow us to, may may result in something that does describe our reality. The problem that I have is the, is, the, is the claim that because it's so beautiful, it must describe reality because that's a kind of religious faith. And, and, mm. and I think everyone should realize that most physics ideas, no matter how elegant or beautiful they are, are wrong. Mm. If they weren't, anyone could do it. I mean, I've had, I just, I just, I just did a podcast with a friend of mine, Lenny Susskind, who, Talk, talking about one of a beautiful idea he had years ago, which was wrong, and it, and it, and the fact that it was elegant and interesting was nice. And I've had similar, I think, ideas. And nature just decides what's right or wrong. And so, if you had to guess, is any new idea right or wrong in science? You, in, in advance of knowing what it is, you, you your money would be best spent on assuming it's wrong. And, yeah, and therefore, yeah. the, the, I think the smart money is going to suggest that. That string theory, at least as we now understand, it, is probably wrong. It may lead to something that is is absolutely right, and that that doesn't that's no. I'm not casting aspersions on string theory. I'm just saying it's a it's just a property of 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 science that nature, mm. the imagination of nature, tends to be far greater than our own, which is why we have to look outward rather than inward, which is why we continue to need to do experiments because we're surprised. And I I often say every day I wake up and I'm surprised if I'm not surprised because. <laughs> Because nature, that's what's wonderful about nature. And that's what's, once again, you know, ties into the title of the book, The Known Unknowns, is that is that uh, recognizing that nature is going to surprise you and that there are things you don't understand is, is makes every day much more fun. Yeah, yeah. 
I do agree. I mean, you also have a chapter on consciousness in, in this yeah. book yes. as one of the great mysteries, so to speak. Um, what is your, I mean, what is your take on consciousness? There are so many ideas, panpsychism and, uh, and dualism and uh, emergent phenomena. What's your position? Well, my position is that of all the things I talk about, consciousness is the least understood mm. for many reasons, because we really, in fact, it's rather interesting. Uh, someone, we started talking about quantum mechanics and someone mm. once told me, and I think it's true, that you can tell how much is known about a subject by how many books are written about it. Mm. The more books, the less is known. <laughs> yeah, and, okay. You know, and I have Dirac's book on quantum mechanics up on the shelf here, right there written in, I don't know, 1930-something. You only need that one book. I mean, you don't have to... There are lots of other books that help explain it different ways, but but that book is suffices. You read that book and you understand quantum mechanics. The, there are many books on, uh, on consciousness because it's so difficult. And in fact, what I discovered, and I spent... You know, I've spent a lot of time with people who study consciousness, so that was useful, but, I, but as a beginning tutorial, but then I tried to read a lot. And what I discovered is even most people who study consciousness try not to define it because mm. it's so elusive. And the problem is we can't probe it directly. It's like an extra dimension of space, but in some sense even worse because, because we get false positives. We can't, we can't probe the con I have my two dogs are sleeping here. Mm. I can't probe their consciousness directly. I see their behavior and I like to think my dog is happy when I come home and, 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 you know, he behaves that way, but, but I'm imputing things on him. And you might say, well, okay, that's okay, but we can probe our own consciousness. And we, and what I show in that chapter is even, we often fool ourselves about what we, our own consciousness, why we, what we think we are conscious of is often not what we're really conscious of. And mm. so I left it for the end because I think it is the most complicated and the least well understood and the least amenable right now to experiment. And it also opens mm. me up to the future because that allowed me to, to, to go to one of my favorite quotes again from Richard Feynman, which is that if you can't build it, you don't understand it. And <laughs> ultimately, I, I think, I really do think that one of the ways we may understand consciousness in the end is not by trying to understand our own, but by creating one, an AI that's conscious. And, and I think that that, yeah. may be, that may help lead us to the notion, you know, my friend Noam Chomsky, when I talked to him about consciousness, said it may be a red herring itself that that what we call consciousness may not be relevant at all. It may be some mathematical equation that describes something else. And, 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 uh, and consciousness may just be a, a, a side product that is again, a red herring. And um, yeah, if we create, and, and when I say we may create consciousness, of course that creates lots of scary notions for people that AI. Yeah. Is conscious. I love to talk about that, but first uh, this, this concept of panpsychism that seems to be trending right now. I mean, the idea that consciousness should be like a fundamental property of matter itself. No, that's such, uh, such nonsense in my opinion. Well, yeah, I mean, my, my take on that is that maybe may, maybe it could be true, but it doesn't explain anything because you, no. still have to, you still have to explain why it appears not in a stone, but in a human. So it has no explanatory power at all. Well, right it, I think having no explanatory power in my mind is, 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 is somewhat sim similar to saying it's nonsense. <laughs> um, okay. I say it in a nicer way though. Yeah. Yeah. But if it doesn't explain anything, I don't know why one talks about it, but, but, um, <laughs> Except but to it sound trendy. eloquent, or 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 to sell books, or to or to, or, or to build people out of money, uh, I, <laughs> the only person I think who really believes that everything is conscious is, is conscious, including elementary particles, is Deep, Deepak Chopra. And, <laughs> and, and, but but uh, yeah. I think um, I, I, look, it's clear that you cannot impute e consciousness even from behavior, as I try and show in the book. And I I yeah, quoted yeah. Bertrand Russell that there's not much difference between a protozoa. In, in, in behavior, there's not such difference between a human being and a protozoa. It's actually true. El, you know, single-celled objects can can avoid harsh environments and even, in some sense, learn about where to go. They don't have a single neuron, so obviously they're not conscious. And so, um, imposing this notion of consciousness, which clearly requires a very complex neurological structure, so complex that we're not certain if even our nearest uh, evolutionary neighbors. Are conscious. We don't even know that. Uh, that that clearly requires a level of complexity that 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 is uh, that we don't quite understand. And I like to say my 
my my computer i used to say my mac is maybe more conscious than a pc but it's nowhere near as conscious <laughs> as a human being and 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 uh and but but you know and some people think G chat gpt is conscious it's it, it's mm -hmm. not and, and and i think that's an illusion as well but it's an interesting illusion because then it, you try and ask yourself the question how do you know if something's conscious if something if i can mm -hmm. have a conversation with something that appears to be a thinking being the, the old mm -hmm. turing test the old yeah. turing test is clearly not applicable it's not adequate enough in my mind i think some of the some of the if I were going to get start to give a test, it's not being able to answer questions. It's being able mm -hmm. to ask questions. That is mm -hmm. the first road to consciousness, I think. Yeah. But but I mean, <clears throat> still, this panpsychism idea seems to be taken seriously by quite a few philosophers. Why well, do you think yeah, that well, is? Because... I, you're going to get me to say something un, un, unfortunate about philosophers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I already, I already have a bad rap in terms. Of, I don't. I really do value philosophy, but 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 I, the reason to make fun of. Look, I don't care what's taken seriously. I really care about what leads to, what leads to progress of understanding nature. And there are lots of things that are taken seriously, and some of them may be right. But I see no evidence in everything I understand about nature that consciousness has anything to do with the universe or elementary particles. The elements that make you, my body and your body up were formed in stars in supernova explosions that happened before any consciousness existed in the universe, or at least on Earth. They didn't mm. care about our existence. Consciousness is not central to the universe. It's a byproduct. And for all we know, it may only exist here on Earth. And if it does, we should be more precious about it. Mm, good point. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of AI that we touched upon, I mean, um, obviously, AI will be able to simulate consciousness uh, so well, so some people will not be able to to distinguish this from real consciousness. Do you agree with that? I, I, guess. I think I see no obstacle to to creating consciousness. I mean, I don't think there's anything mm. mystical about our brains. It's a physics. Are we're we're a product of physics and chemistry. Yeah. And if we're a product of physics and chemistry and be conscious. I can't. I don't see any obstacle to creating another system. That it's a product of physics and chemistry yeah. that can be conscious. No, I and, understand. And, you, you believe you believe that AI might get conscious one day. Well, again, I never use the word believe. I say, is it likely or unlikely? I don't like the word yeah. believe. I think it's quite likely that that will will create systems that are conscious, and I think it's quite likely will create systems that therefore can probably progress intellectually much faster than us. And mm -hmm. therefore, if you're asking if AI will one day be much more intelligent than us, I think it's quite likely. But yeah. I don't view that as the end of the world. I, I, yeah. I you know, there are dangers, and and we yeah. should be aware of them. Fortune favors the prepared mind, as Louis Pasteur said. <laughs> but, but I also think it's quite exciting. As a physicist, I'd like yeah. to know if in what what physics questions an AI found interesting, and um, and and the example I use in the end of the book is is a historical example. But again, I'm I like history. Is is the invention of writing? happened sometime, you know, in, in, in ancient Greece in the sixth or seventh century, uh, start, you know, started in the ninth century when language, but, but, uh, but er, the early philosophers decried it. Plato, Socrates all said writing was the end of storytelling mm. uh, because, you know, you wouldn't have to remember, think, and it meant less to, you know, to, to write something down than to, to talk to someone. Well, it changed things. I don't, I think as a writer, I wouldn't say it was the end of storytelling. It just changed <laughs> things. And I suspect yeah. It's quite every every technological invention we make that's of, of significance has changed what it means to be human in some fundamental way. And mm -hmm. and I think AI is another one of them. And, and it could lead to disaster. It could make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the day of what you ask me, what's likely. But that's what's wonderful about the future. It's both terrifying and exciting. And mm -hmm. that makes it different than the past and what makes it worth living. But the problem with AI, I, I would say, is that uh, the, uh, it will be able to simulate consciousness long before it actually gets conscious, which means that we will not know the day when they really get conscious. Do you see what I mean? Because they will now, fail yeah, before that. Yeah, but uh, I mean, but then again, I think that's a cement. Well, that that may that may be unimportant. The question is, mm. what will AI be able to do? Yeah. Not not what will it appear to be. But mm. what to do that can't be done now, and I think that's more important. So I'm I'm a kind of, um, uh, you know, I take Einstein's view of, of, of thinking about things operationally. What matters is 
is is what can be done and and yeah. what you can and do an experiment and so you're right i think it's going to sociologically it already has I, there are many yeah. people for some reason who think that somehow chat gpt is conscious or at least their conversations are with it it has some inherent understanding of what it's doing that it it doesn't have and that's going to affect the way people interact with it and and a lot of social and political things but it's not yeah. going to change what chat gpt can do which is what matters to me yeah yeah uh, it is very impressing uh, uh yeah. impressive i think the, well yes yeah. no it's impressive and unimpressive to me at the same time i will say and it may be a property of my age and i just turned 70 um <laughs> that um that i don't use i don't use, i played with it early on and it didn't impress me if i write my own things i tend to search for things myself i find it more gratifying so i don't i don't use it and when i do i'm very suspicious of, mm. of of what i what it of what it might tell me and i've seen examples of course because it it garbage in it and gar it produces garbage out and we've already seen in many examples especially in with google but to some extent with chat gpt of where this this remarkable politically correct critical social justice view of the world has been input into into what chat gpt yeah. will say and I, I, I did an example early on where I, where I had to try and talk about gender and it wouldn't talk about gender. It, it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't want to talk about gender and sex for obvious reasons. And, and yeah. so I think we have to also recognize its severe limitations. Okay, one last question, which goes a little bit out, outside from the topic of your book, but you are uh, in a few months having an election in America. What, what's your what's your view of the current situation? Uh, no, it's dismal, here. which is why one of the reasons, by the way, why I now no longer live in America. I, li I, I live uh, in yeah. Canada here. You're in Canada. One reason, yeah, that's yeah right. one of the reasons I moved, there were many reasons. But one of the reasons was the, the the political situation is so toxic in the United States right now that I'm not optimistic um, mm. uh, about I, I you know I do think at this point it's reasonably likely that Donald Trump will win, which is it's, in the abstract sounds almost impossible given everything mm. one knows about the man and his actions, and mm. and you know and will that be the end of the world? Maybe not. The first term of his produced a lot of not. Uh, hurt the world in many ways, but it also probably helped the world in other ways. It didn't, certainly we didn't die in nuclear war, um, mm. which some people might have predicted. Uh, and so it maybe is, is never as bad as, as, as you think. But the problem with politics and almost everything else is it's much easier to do bad than good. Mm. And I don't see any reasonable, I don't see reason as playing a key role. I, I mean, it happened for a long time in politics, but it's so far removed from the political world right now reality is so far removed from the political world on both the left and the right mm. that i find it pro and that's for me the problematic thing because i don't care if people believe nonsense it's the fact that their belief in nonsense produces nonsensical actions and mm. and when you when you when you divorce yourself from reality the policies you make are inevitably going to be bad and and i think uh it saddens me that we can't have that 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 the United States, which is still the most powerful country in the world, has a completely dysfunctional political system where nothing important can ever be discussed and no actions that are really relevant and useful can be taken because it's because of this game uh, of that people are playing this political game that people are playing. So I'm afraid I'm a real pessimist when it comes to the upcoming U.S. elections, and that's fine. Because mm. two, two things, I'll end on this. You live in Canada. <laughs> well, no, no, the whole world's going to be impacted. But yeah. it's fine for two reasons. First of all, I, if I'm wrong, then I'll be happy, right? If I'm, if I'm, mm. it could only be better than I, I think. But the other thing is comes from a friend, a late friend of mine, who, um, uh, who actually edited one of my books, the Cormac McCarthy, a great American writer. Yeah. Uh, who, who once told me, and it's now become my mantra. I, I said, you know, how can you be so chipper and happy the first time I met him because his books are so dark? And he said to me, you know, I'm a pessimist, but that's no reason to be gloomy. And that's my <laughs> attitude to the world. <laughs> that's a wonderful way to end this podcast. Lawrence Krauss, thank you so much for being in Fritanke Podcast. It's been a pleasure.